Well, this morning we're going to come and look, we're going to read a very familiar text, uh, which we're going to make reference to a couple of times as we're um, looking through, uh, well, this particular sermon. But as you know, this, uh, these messages have been primarily uh, topical messages, so I'm not going to necessarily exegete everything in here. Uh, we'll, we'll do that again in the future, uh, not, not too long from now, but I think um, it would be very helpful for us uh, to get, I think, a bit of a larger picture of our Lord Jesus, um, again, his exaltation primarily, although we are going to look somewhat at his humiliation. But let me just read uh, our text, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11, though what we're going to look at this morning may be more focused primarily on verses 5 through 11. But this is what Paul writes to the church at Philippi. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, we saw last week that our Lord Jesus Christ became a curse for us, that he was nailed to the cross, that he had our sins laid upon him, and that he suffered his Father's full wrath, the wrath that was actually meant for us, the wrath that would have pushed us down into hell, into everlasting torment forever. Jesus humbled himself to become a curse for us on the cross, and he endured that for us. We saw that when he died, remember the wages of sin is death, that he was taking upon himself the obligation to pay that debt for us. He died in our place. We, we saw that he was buried and that his body didn't see corruption, but that he would only be there for three days. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. We saw he rose from the dead because death really could no longer hold him. Remember, it was our sins that put him in the grave. The wages of sin is death. He had to die. But having died and having paid our debt, he was released from, that, uh, from, that, from the grave, from death. Our sins were now fully paid. The fact that he rose again from the dead indicates to us that they have been discharged. And so the Prince of Life returned to life, never to die again. The Scripture says, because He lives, we also will live forever with Him if we have believed in Him, if we are trusting Him, if we are following Him and living for Him. That's the evidence that we have actually believed, that we have actually trusted. Now, as I've already told you, today we're going to consider what happened uh, next. Uh, we saw last time that after Jesus rose again from the dead, that he appeared 
to his disciples on a few different occasions. He appeared to over 500 at one time. And he did that so that there might be many witnesses to his resurrection. We weren't there. We didn't see it, but we do have many eyewitness testimonies. We have them recorded in the Word of God, and we have the Holy Spirit bearing witness to this, that this is God's Word. We know that this took place. But after his resurrection and after his appearance, he ascended into heaven that he might be crowned king, king over all creation. Now, we do know that he was already king. He's the son of God. He's sovereign over the entire universe. But he was crowned king as the God-man. This is the first time that the God-man has entered into heaven. And he was given this position. He was given this authority to continue our work as mediator that he might bring us to heaven. And as we've already seen, he was given the promise that for his humiliation, he was exalted and being exalted one day every single knee would bow to him. Every tongue would confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now what I thought we would do this morning is simply begin with a brief overview of the work that he did on, the, uh, on earth as our prophet, our priest, and our king to remind us that this is the work he continues in heaven. We're going to look at what he did on earth and this evening we're going to look at what he, he does in heaven. But I want us to look at what he did on earth because this is the, the work that he did for which he was exalted. This is his humiliation. Let, let's not forget who it is that's doing these things. The one who is God humbled himself to serve us in these three offices so that he might lift us to heaven. Remember the difficulty that Peter had when Jesus came to wash his feet? We should be having that same kind of tension and difficulty. God came down and he did these things to cleanse me of my sins so that I might be lifted up to heaven. Lord, don't wash my feet. But then Jesus says, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. We need this work of the Lord Jesus. We need this humiliation. We need him in his exaltation too. But let's look again at what he did in his humiliation to save us. And then we'll look at his exaltation to heaven this evening, we'll look again at that continuing work in heaven. Well, Jesus, first of all, came into this world to show us the Father, to reveal him to us as our prophet. Remember, as our prophet, he reveals to us the will of God for our salvation, but he also reveals God himself. John writes in John 1, verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. That is, Jesus came down and became flesh that He might reveal the nature of the Father, the nature of God, in terms we can understand. He explained Him. He exegeted Him. We now see what He is like. So Jesus did that. He did that in a couple of different ways. He did that by the things He taught regarding the Father, but He also did it through His life. John wrote a little bit earlier in chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when those who were there saw Jesus, I mean, what did they see? Did they see this man who glows in the dark? Did they see a man with a halo over his head? No, they didn't see visible glory in that way, but what they did see was the nature of God. They saw the glory of his holiness, and that's what he came to reveal, to show us what God is like, to teach us and to show us. Now, he came not only to show us what the Father is like, but he also came to show us how we as his enemies could be reconciled to him how we could come to know him personally through the work that Jesus had come to do and how, having come to know him, we could become like him through the guidance of his word and the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus has given us these things. You know, it was so important to Jesus that we know what we needed 
that Jesus is said even to continue to teach his disciples from the time he rose from the dead to the time he ascended. Luke writes in the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 3, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Jesus continued to teach as the prophet, as the prophet from God, the things that we needed to know. And you know that even after he ascended, he sent his spirit into the world to oversee his uh, his disciples, his apostles, as they wrote the rest of the New Testament, which explains to us what it is that Jesus actually came and taught us by his coming and through his work. So he is our prophet. Now, Jesus also came to do what was necessary to reconcile us to the Father as our priest. And this is usually where we think of Jesus' service for us. But remember, his ministry as prophet was also very, very important. Without the truth, we would be walking in the darkness. We needed that truth. Jesus gave it to us. As a matter of fact, he had been giving it to us even before he came into the world because it was his spirit that inspired the Old Testament, the Old Covenant prophets. Well, Jesus is our high priest, also ministers to us. First of all, in his prayers, in what we call his high priestly prayer in John 17, verses 20 and 21. He was praying, notice, not just for his disciples, but he was praying for us. He says to the Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. You know, the work of the priest was really twofold. He was to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people and he was to pray for the people. Jesus was praying for us. He was praying for all of his sheep before his sacrifice because obviously after his sacrifice, he wouldn't be able to do that on earth. But Jesus prayed and Jesus made sacrifice. Although in this case, he sacrificed himself to take away our sins. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. And again, realize that what Jesus said to his disciples then, he was also speaking to us now. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Unlike the hired hand who runs away because he doesn't want to give his life, Jesus stands on the front line, and he willingly sacrifices himself to save his sheep from the wolf who is already basically has them. He has delivered us out of his kingdom. Then he goes on to say, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. That is us. Jesus was speaking about us. We are his sheep. He laid down his life for us. So through his prayers and his sacrifice, he has done what is necessary as our priest to reconcile us to the Father once and for all. And Jesus also came as our king to conquer the enemy of our souls, basically the one Adam handed us over to in his decision to eat of that tree, the one who would have ruined us forever, the one who was basically in control of that kingdom that we were born into because of Adam. When Jesus died on the cross, he dealt a decisive a mortal, a killing blow to the head of the serpent. And he freed us from his power so that 
he might bring us into his eternal kingdom. Remember what Jesus said when the, the Pharisees accused him of uh, doing the work that he did by the power of the evil one. He says, if Satan is divided against himself, his kingdom's going to fall. But if I, by the Spirit of God, delivered this man, the kingdom of God has come upon you. But how can anyone spoil the strong man's house unless he first binds the strong man? Jesus bound the strong man by his coming. He was plundering his kingdom, but it was on the cross that he dealt this decisive blow against the enemy and freed us forever. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. And by the descendant of Abraham, he's not talking about Jews, natural Jews, because the natural Jews really aren't the children of the kingdom. It's those who have the faith of Abraham who are the children of the kingdom. They are the true children of promise like Isaac. And if you're trusting in Jesus, Jesus gives help to you. He did this for you. He became a man that he might sacrifice himself, that he might die to take the devil's power away from you and set you free. That's what Jesus has done. Paul writes in our text in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, the summary of what we've just seen is his work as prophet, priest, and king. He says, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Basically, Paul just summarized everything we saw in this one section. Jesus humbled himself. He took our nature. He became one with us that he might take up these three offices, that he might become a minister to us, a servant to us, that which was pictured in that foot washing sign that Jesus gave in the upper room, that through his teaching, through his prayers and his sacrifice, and through his battle with our enemy on the cross, he might deliver us from death and eventually bring us to heaven. Now, we take this for granted, but remember who it is that did this for us. This is the Son of God who humbled himself in an infinite degree, the Creator becoming one of his creatures that he might serve us so that we might be saved. So what is it that Jesus actually received for this humbling, for this emptying of himself to become the minister of our salvation, to become our Savior, that he might bring us to glory? Well, Paul tells us in the following verses that he was exalted. He says in verses 9 through 11, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this is what we want to look at now, the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom we love, the reward that he got for doing this work for us. Now his exaltation began at his resurrection. The fact that he was released from death, the fact that he conquered death, the fact that he now is risen uh, and has been vindicated as we saw, justified, the Father was declaring, this is my son, he was declared the Son of God by, uh, by, with power by the resurrection from the dead. That was also his vindication that he was everything that he claimed to be. He actually is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He has conquered death. He has taken away sin. He has overcome the enemy. But his exaltation was raised to a much higher level when he ascended into heaven. Luke writes this in Luke 24, verses 50 through 51. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. 
While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And then Luke expands on this a bit in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way you have watched him go into heaven. Jesus ascended bodily into heaven. Now, he returned to heaven because that is where the Bible says Jesus actually came from. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, verse 28, I came forth from the Father and have come into this world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. And Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 through 10 in this way. He says, now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Now Jesus descended from heaven through his incarnation into what Paul describes as the lower parts of the earth. This is not talking about hell. He experienced hell on the cross. There wasn't this, you know, two compartment kind of idea that Jesus went into the lower parts of the earth. But Paul is basically saying he went from heaven down to earth in his incarnation. He entered into the world. And he did this, as we've seen, that he might defeat the enemy of our souls. And having now won this battle and having saved his people, he ascends again into heaven now as the God-man. Now, it's likely that the cloud that received him, as they're watching, remember a cloud received him and took him up into heaven, was meant to confirm to them again just who this one was that was taken up from them. I mean, who is it after all that the scripture tells us rides on the clouds? It's really only the Lord. This is an Old Testament image, basically of the Lord. The psalmist writes in Psalm 104, verse 3, He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. Remember, we just heard the angel said, why are you looking up into the sky? This Jesus that was taken up from you into heaven, as you've just seen him, will come in exactly the same way. Do you realize that that is what Jesus said about himself earlier before the high priest that he would return in the clouds when the high priest questioned him in Mark 14 verses 61 and 62 are you the Christ the son of the blessed one Jesus said I am and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven By the way, I can't resist, but I do believe when he said this, what he was referring to was his coming to judge the Jews because of their rejection, because of their crucifixion. And I want you to notice that he said that he was going to come in the sight of the high priest. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory, he says in another text, which means he was coming during the lifetime of the high priest. Now it's interesting too that the scriptures tell us in the Old Testament that when the Lord represented himself as coming in judgment against a nation, he represented him himself basically as a king riding out against that nation in his royal chariot. And of course, being God, his chariot would be the clouds as we've just seen. We read in Isaiah 19, verse 1, when he's talking about his judgment against Egypt, the oracle concerning Egypt, behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. 
This is simply a symbol of judgment, one who is coming in judgment, riding in judgment out to face the enemy. And of course, when the Lord comes against an enemy, the enemy trembles. Jesus ascended in this cloud. Jesus is going to come again on this cloud. Now, the cloud that met Jesus as he ascended must also have reminded his disciples, if they knew their Bibles well, of what Daniel saw in one of his visions regarding uh, the exaltation of the Son of Man or the Messiah. We read in uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel here was writing of the coronation of Messiah, the day that Jesus would be crowned king over all creation. This is when his reign as mediator began. Now, it began when he ascended, not when Daniel saw the vision, but Daniel was seeing the vision of this particular event. When Jesus would be given control of the universe, when it was transferred to him, not as the Son of God, but as the God-man, as the mediator. When he sat down at the right hand of God with the promise that the Father would eventually subdue all of his enemies under his feet. Remember, to him was given dominion over all, that all nation, every tongue would serve him. That's exactly what the author to the Hebrews referred to in the meditation we read at the beginning in Hebrews 10, verses 11 through 13. Every priest stands daily ministry and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. I hope you can see as we tie all these things together that his rule as king is not, is not in the future. The, his rule as king is right now. He is reigning over all things. But when this promise of all of his enemies being subdued under his feet has been fulfilled, when all of them have been defeated but one, he is going to return to defeat the last enemy, which is death. And let me just note right here before I read this passage, this means that all the other enemies must be subdued before he returns to subdue the last enemy, which is death. And we're going to see he does that when he comes again to raise the dead. Now, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 26, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, and that enemy will be subdued once and for all when he returns at his second coming to raise the dead. Listen to what Paul says in the same chapter in verses 53 through 55. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now just to project this a little bit further ahead, We'll just round off this basically mini lesson in eschatology. When Jesus returns, he's going to return to vanquish that last enemy, which is death, and he's going to do that by raising the dead. When he comes to raise the dead, we know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at the same time, he's also going to raise all the living or translate the living. 
But he's doing that to gather everyone together, everyone who has ever lived and everybody who was alive at that time for the final judgment, which we know our Lord Jesus Christ and his exaltation was given the honor also of being judge at that judgment. And at that judgment, he will separate everyone who has ever lived into two groups, those who are in his kingdom, the sheep, those who are not in his kingdom, the goats. He will explain what it is, of course, that each has done, or at least what one has done, what the other has not done. Actually, the Bible tells us they're going to be judged according to everything that they've ever done, even every idle word that is spoken, at least the goats. The sheep are only going to be rewarded for what it is that they have done done. They will be presented before the Lord blameless on that day. But after the judgment is going to come the final separation. The sheep will be welcomed into the kingdom and inherit the eternal kingdom. The goats will go away forever into the lake of fire. And then Jesus will enjoy his bride. He will rejoy, he, he's going to enjoy his redeemed people. He's going to enjoy us, the people he saved by his death by shedding his blood through his entire work in the new heavens and the new earth that he is going to bring in. And we will enjoy him there forever. Now again, the point is this, because Jesus was willing to humble himself to the degree that he did, because being God, he was willing to become a man and subject himself to death, even become a curse for us on the cross, the Father has given to him this honor the name which is above every name, and the promise that one day everyone will bow the knee to him. Not only his, his children, which again, they bow the knee because he has mercifully changed their hearts, but even his enemies will bow the knee to him. So let me close simply by asking this question this morning. Have you bowed your knee to Jesus? You see, you either, you're going to bow the knee one way or the other, right? You're either going to do it willingly or you're going to do it, we can't say unwillingly, but perhaps not under the circumstances you might have hoped. You're either going to bow before him because you love him or you're going to bow before him because you have been defeated by him. But the Bible says if you bow the knee before him now, if you humble yourself now, confess your sins, turn from your sins, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, He will forgive you. He will save you. He will adopt you as His sons and daughters. He will give you a place in His kingdom. You will be numbered among the sheep on that day and receive the benediction, the blessing of our Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. If that's what you want to hear, you have to humble yourself, trust in Him now, follow Him now. That's the only way. But the second question is this, have you humbled yourself? If you have humbled yourself, if you are trusting in the Lord, the second question is, do you want honor in this kingdom? Do you want to be exalted? Do you want, to, do you, want you know, again, what James and John wanted, that, that place of greatest honor? Well, Jesus says, if that's what you want, you must humble yourself again, as Jesus did, and you must serve him. You must serve your brothers and your sisters. You must serve your neighbor. In other words, you need to follow Jesus, do what he did. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 5, and this is the reason why he brought Jesus up in the first place, because he wanted the Philippians to follow his example. He says this, do nothing from selfishness. Or empty conceits, you know, trying to bolster yourself. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. When Jesus did what he did, he, he didn't have his eyes just on the glory that was promised, he had his eyes set as well on the interests of his people. He humbled himself to serve us, to serve his people. And that's what we need to do. Remember, Jesus not only saved us through his humiliation, he also gave us an example that he wants us to follow. If you want to be first in his kingdom, you must become the last 
of all. The way to greatness is basically the path of humiliation. That is the way it works in this kingdom, completely the opposite of the way it works in the world. But that's what we need to bear in mind if we want the glory that comes from our Lord. Again, look at Jesus. That's the path he took. That's the path we must also take. Now tonight, as I've said, <clears throat> we're going to look at his continuing ministry for us in, in heaven, uh, where he continues to exercise his office as prophet, priest, and king. And I believe it's important that we understand how he does that so that we may see what he's continuing to do and, and draw comfort from that and the assurance that our king, our priest, our prophet is going to make sure that we actually arrive there. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to apply what we've just heard and let's also ask him to prepare us to come to the table, which is a visible representation to us of the humiliation of our Lord Jesus because the one who gave himself up to be sacrificed on the cross, to become a curse, is not just a man. He is the God-man. And this is infinite, infinite humiliation and condescension on his part. But let's not forget why he did that, because he loves us. If we're trusting him this morning, if we've turned from our sins and are following him, he loves us. And he has done this so that we might enter into heaven. So let's, let's spend just a few moments in prayer, shall we?